On November 2nd, 2020, a team of scientists published a research article that you may have seen on our website and many, many others. This article seemed to indicate that Game of Thrones' intense popularity could be explained through data science and that the deaths in the franchise weren't as random as they might have felt. I needed to know what was going on. Fortunately, some great people were willing to help me. Hi, Jason. I had the pleasure to sit down with some of the authors of this study. My name is Colm Connaughton. My name is Patrick McCarran. I'm Thomas Gessie Jones. So I'm Robin Dunbar. They were kind enough to sit down with me and explain their work. So thank you, gentlemen. And here is what I learned. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. There was a time where you couldn't go anywhere without hearing about Game of Thrones. It was unavoidable. The show was a transformative work unlike any other. And while it's still up for debate when the golden age of television started, there can be no question that Game of Thrones has been the biggest contributor. And it's not hard to see why. Just reading off a fact sheet, we can see that Game of Thrones was a television production unlike anything done before. The budget was higher than any TV show prior, with its final season surpassing $90 million. And while most TV shows gradually decline in viewers by the end of their run, Game of Thrones broke its record with over 19.3 million people watching the finale. And that's not taking into account the rampant piracy that the show had to deal with. A British piracy monitoring group puts that number at 90 million. People were engaged, even if they had some criticisms. The last season is definitely the worst. And why it was unequivocally one of the worst of all time. I would imagine those guys regret making Bran the king because... <laughs> that doesn't change the love there was for the world of Westeros. Even when it was being made fun of, that love still came through. Winter is coming, Sharon. And I'm a sneaky little bee. Buzz buzz. And even if you hated the final seasons, you hated it because you loved what came before. And for many, that love turned into obsessive looks into every single minute detail. But what caused this? We had seen fantasy worlds of this scale in film before, with movies like The Chronicles of Narnia, Star Wars, and Lord of the Rings, which also made a noticeable impact on the film world. And they all, to varying degrees, had their own obsessive fandoms. But that doesn't explain what it is that triggers a fan base from simply buying merchandise to naming their baby after their favorite character. If it were as easy as simply building a fantasy world, the Dungeons & Dragons movie would have been a box office smash. So, for an explanation, I turn to our friends. So, what creates a fandom like this? In a way, what creates a fandom is the skill of the storyteller, right? And that means maintaining a kind of flow to the story that pulls you along and makes you turn the page to see what's going to happen next and start the next chapter, even though it's already two o'clock in the morning and really you should go to bed. And part of that skill then depends on the writer not overtaxing the reader's psychological capacities to handle social information. And this you know, that doesn't push the reader beyond these natural limits in terms of group sizes and the reader's ability to unpack what the characters are thinking. And you can only handle so many of those at any one time. And a really skilled writer is able to stay within those limits, but create a kind of excitement to the story, which is forever kind of just making you turn the page. And a lot of very compelling novels have become really successful films. Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, and The Hunger Games all began as novels before receiving their respective adaptations all within the last two decades. Even less critically beloved but still wildly successful adaptations like The Twilight Saga did remarkably well at the box office. But obviously, it can't just be any books that will make a great film. You know, although everybody can enjoy a story, a good story, you know, when they read it or they see it in the theater or in a film, probably less than, well less than 20% of people can write a good story. And, and probably a lot fewer than that are really skilled at it in the Shakespeare and George Martin league. So perhaps Martin is just that good of a writer. It would certainly appear that way. And it is worth considering that the fan base did begin to voice more negative opinions regarding the show around the time his writing disappeared. So was there something unique about A Song of Ice and Fire? A Song of Ice and Fire is well known for its scale and complexity. And the fact is that there are 
over 2,000 named characters in the books and tens of thousands of interactions between them. So you might think that it's quite possible that a narrative of this scale could become impenetrably complex. And the question that we set out to try to answer was, well, why is that not the case? The main proposal that we advance in, in, in this work is that the reason why the narrative is successful is that it marries a good balance of retaining a realistic degree of structure in the social network between the characters in the book in the sense that it, the network of interactions among the characters is comparable to the kind of social networks which we encounter in real life and don't become more complex than the kind of networks that we have evolved our cognitive abilities to be able to process. And a second sort of strand of it is that we also argue that the order and pacing of events as related in the book is arranged in such a way that it continues to produce surprises in some sense uh, as experienced by the reader. So there's a sense in which the narrative is um, unpredictable, which we try to quantify. The article states that in the A Song of Ice and Fire novels, the 14 major POV characters have an average degree of 154.0 within the network of all characters. This is close to Dunbar's number of 150. So what is Dunbar's number? So Dunbar's number is the limit on the number of meaningful relationships any one person can have at any one time. On average, it's about 150. I mean, it varies from one individual to another, from about 100 up to about 250. But that's the number of family and friends who mean something to you. So does the fact that there's so many point of view characters impact the reader's ability to follow the narrative? The number of point of view characters is uh, the major point of view characters who have what we define as more than four chapters, because it's the occasional one with just one or two chapters. Um, th for them, there's only about four, there's 14 of them, I think, as we define it. And these, this is also quite close to a uh, one of the Dunbar numbers for closer relationships rather than just acquaintances. Um, and that is also possibly quite useful for uh, the realism of the network in that the person reading it only uh, knows well this small small group of people because if you try to extend it maybe further so you, you knew well 30 40 50 characters it would be quite hard to hard to follow so the relationships are within our cognitive limits and as a result we're able to remain engaged but we wouldn't be able to do so if the content wasn't compelling too how does this compare to other narratives I guess one of the differences between this uh, and other narratives we looked at is we have the temporal aspect. So the, it grows chapter by chapter, but also then we have the, the timeline from that Reddit thread. Uh, so we're able to analyze it in a more temporally rather than just like a static snapshot at the end. Um, however, when we do look at other, like I've looked at a lot of social networks in mythology, and uh, so the, the social network of Song of Ice and Fire looks more like social networks presented in the sagas of the Icelanders than it does to something like uh, Beowulf. And one of the biggest selling points of A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones was regarding the seemingly random deaths of so many major characters. Like when you first heard about Game of Thrones, you likely heard about the Red Wedding as this defining moment in the series. And once you saw it, you truly understood the idea that nobody is safe. And really, that idea that no one is safe is what many shallow readings of Game of Thrones pitched the show as. Almost as though viewers were warning each other to not get attached to anyone in this universe, because you never know when your favorite character is going to be suddenly and brutally killed off. It gives the sense that death in this universe is random and unfortunately commonplace. But good news, it isn't. So basically the deaths are, we find, random as you read it. So if you kind of look at it through page after page after page, if you just say, is there a death on this particular page, that it seems to be maximally random in a mathematical sense. What that turns out though, when we use a timeline, you can convert obviously what the pages are to when they occur in kind of the, the in-story timeline. And turns out actually, when you do that, they're not very random at all. They're all very clustered. So things like the Battle of the Blackwater has a lot of deaths. Understandably, it's a battle, a lot of them that. Um, so kind of what you can see is even though in the story, 
like if you were living in the universe, you wouldn't you'd experience the deaths very clustered in battles and things like the Red Wedding and other events where many people are killed. Um, the, how it's written by George R. R. Martin kind of spreads these deaths out, um, and so that people, when they're reading it, the deaths come, you know, sort of randomly as, as you, you go and as, as a reader as you experience the story. So while the events seem random and unpredictable, when the novel is looked at chronologically, the deaths aren't so random. But is reacting to fictional characters this strongly normal behavior? Seemingly, yes, and has been for centuries. In an article for Times Live, Craig Traub, a clinical psychologist and criminologist, says that this phenomenon is far from contemporary and that mass fellowship towards fictional characters has existed since the advent of oral tradition, ancient texts, classical works, and radio serials. These types of story allow the viewer to immerse themselves in a reality similar but different from their own. Which brings us to the topic of escapism. It's important to note the difference between simple immersion and escapism. Becoming immersed in a story is normal. It happens when you find a story or experience compelling. But according to an article titled The Rationality of Escapism and Self-Deception in the journal Behavior and Philosophy, escapism is defined as the attempt to avoid awareness of aversive beliefs. In the previously mentioned Times Live article, Pauline Mawson, a clinical psychologist, holds the opinion that Game of Thrones offered people an opportunity to escape from their reality and live someone else's reality. She compares the series to the Fifty Shades of Grey films, stating that Fifty Shades of Grey, like Game of Thrones, tapped into the darker side of our consciousness. These dark thoughts seem more acceptable when shared by a collective community, the audience. Of course, that is exclusively the negative side of escapism. George R. R. Martin himself used books and comics to escape from his own life as a kid. Martin was quoted as saying, Through books, I experienced a much bigger life. I mean, I could go to Mars, I could go to other planets, I could go to the Middle Ages and adventure with Robin Hood or King Arthur and his knights, or I could go to Gotham City or Metropolis to check in on Superman or Batman. So books brought in my world and made it much richer and more exciting. Escapism allowed Martin to explore worlds he simply wasn't able to, and they allowed his imagination to expand, in a way that likely contributed to his ability to write these stories we enjoy so much. I asked Professor Dunbar what he thought. Well, I think escapism is, in a way, it's one of the things that keeps us going. You know, it it uh, it, it kind of is fun to 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 do whatever it may be, whether it's playing uh, um, uh, online computer games or uh, you know reading books or, or or watching you know very long TV series box sets <laughs> by by the volume. All these things they. Yeah, I, I think it actually goes back to the fact that storytelling in itself is a core part of what it is to be human. It plays a very important role in creating a sense of community. It's one of the, the main factors or mechanisms we use to create this sense of belonging to a community. It's how we learn uh, who we are and why we're here and, you know, uh, who's the who's in the tribe and why are they in the tribe? You know, why do we make a tribe? So any kind of storytelling of that kind, I think, is just part and parcel of the natural human process. It's impossible for science to generalize for each individual what it is that made Game of Thrones so addicting. But what we do know, thanks to this research, is that Game of Thrones is written in such a way that it is poised to be able to capture a viewer's attention effectively through means the reader may not even be aware of. And whether it's the fact that the characters are so well written we empathize with them immediately, or that it subverts our expectations of a protagonist by removing their usual plot armor, what can be certain is that Game of Thrones' impact will be felt on the television industry for a very long time. So that's what science has to say about it. I'd like to thank Colm Connaughton, Podrick McCarran, Thomas Gessie Jones, and Robin Dunbar for allowing me to speak with them and their fantastic insights into this topic. But of course, there could be a lot more to it than that. What do you feel is the reason people love Game of Thrones so much? Do you think this is going to be the trend for other large-scale book adaptations? And don't forget to subscribe to Screen Rant to keep up with all the latest videos. Have a good one.